Okay, maybe maybe I get started and introduce um, the speaker. So welcome everyone to the Mechanical Engineering Departmental Seminar. Um, I'm extremely delighted to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Ashigan Henry, who is an Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering at MIT. He holds a BS degree from Florida A&M University and a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. Prior to MIT, he was at Georgia Tech as an assistant professor from 2012 to 2018. Um, professor Henry's primary research is in heat transfer with an emphasis on understanding the science of energy transport, storage, and conversion. And what's really interesting about his team's work is that they dabble both at really small length scales at the atomic level and also at really large length and time scales to develop industrial scale energy technologies to mitigate climate change. His group, in fact, has developed the highest temperature all ceramic mechanical pump to pump liquid metal above 1,400 degrees Celsius. You heard that right, it's 1,400 degrees Celsius. Um, this breakthrough technology is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, Professor Henry is a recipient of a number of awards, including the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Lockheed Inspirational Young Faculty Award, the ASME Young Investigator Award in Heat Transfer, the 2018 World Technology Award in Energy, to name just a few. So we're really eager to hear from you, Ashigan. Um, without any further ado, I give you the virtual floor. Just Thank in you. terms of, sorry, just in terms of housekeeping, uh, if, if questions come up during the presentation, please post them on chat and, you know, we will open up the floor for questions at the end of the um, talk. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, uh, Rainy. I really appreciate it. It's a delight to be able to come and talk to you. I apologize for not being able to be present in person, um, but we'll make do and do the best we can with the uh, virtual interaction. Um, so I was planning to talk about um, two topics, two areas of my research uh, today, thermal batteries and methane pyrolysis. Um, as Rohini mentioned, we also work on uh, molecular dynamics and studying kind of some fundamentals associated with heat transfer. I was gonna not talk about that today, um, but if anyone's interested, feel free to uh, contact me. We can discuss some of those kind of topics as well um, at another time. Uh, today, I want to focus on essentially, um, you know, people often ask me, like, what, what do you work on research wise? Well, I, you know, I, I like to say we we work on anything we think is going to move the needle on climate change. Um, so we are generally pretty agnostic in the things that we work on. We have more ideas to pursue than actual time and bandwidth to pursue them. And so there are two technologies that we've prioritized at the moment um, that seem promising that I'm going to talk about today. One is called thermal battery, shown on the left. I'll talk through what it does, but it in, in essence involves uh, what may sound like a stupid idea, which is conversion of electricity to heat, storing heat only to convert it back to electricity again. And you can imagine that there's a very significant thermodynamic penalty that happens on the efficiency in doing that. Uh, but I'll tell you and walk you through the arguments for why we think it makes sense economically to do that. Uh, the second technology is methane pyrolysis. Um, this is basically where you take electricity envisioned here coming from renewables, use that in combination with methane as like a feedstock, uh, so natural gas, and you use it to make hydrogen. And instead of making CO2, which is the way it currently works for the way pe uh, people produce hydrogen, you now instead make solid carbon. And the solid carbon has uh, greater value than CO2. And so the idea is that this process could be more economically competitive than the current approach, which uh, emits CO2. So let me start with the first one, first issue, uh, energy storage. So the main problem we're trying to solve here is uh, this issue associated with climate change. Um, if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions for the US, um, two of the biggest sectors are electricity and transportation. Um, the kind of most sensible, clear path we have to decarbonizing um, the electricity and transportation sectors basically to come up with a means of doing energy storage so that we can deploy renewables and fully penetrate the grid with renewables and have essentially a fully renewable grid. And then the idea is then for transportation is you want to electrify transportation, switch from gasoline based cars and vehicles to electric vehicles and have those vehicles then charged from a decarbonized grid. 
So ultimately the full load or the full energy consumption associated with transportation in that scenario would shift to the electricity sector and essentially the electricity sector would be responsible for more than 40% of a reduction in CO2 emissions if you can just decarbonize electricity. So there's two things that would happen. You deploy energy storage to be able to decarbonize the existing electricity uh, infrastructure, then the electricity infrastructure has got to essentially be doubled in size to be able to accommodate now all this energy that would be sucked up by transportation. And another big problem I'll talk about is in industry. Industry, as you can see, is the next big section of the pie. Uh, another set of very hard problems, but thankfully it falls into just about four or five really big problems that we need to solve there, not a hundred. Um, so climate change is, you know, the most important problem, in my view, to uh, the survival of the human species on this planet. And uh, the cost of renewables has dropped, but the key is storage. We don't have storage, and so the, the penetration of renewables is limited. So this is a, uh, a rather qualitative plot, but it's, it, it's taken from data. Um, these are estimates based on these three papers you see on the bottom left here. <clears throat> and what this basically says is uh, all these studies kind of reach the same conclusions that if you don't have storage, how much renewable penetration you can get on the grid is limited. Currently, it, it's at about like 25% globally. Um, but what the main point of this plot is that <clears throat> in order to get to significantly higher penetrations, you know, above 50% um, into the 80s and 90s, you need not just a factor of two reduction in the cost of storage, you need like orders of magnitude reduction in cost. So just to get like a doubling or tripling of the amount of renewable penetration, you need actually orders of magnitude decrease in the cost of energy storage. So that's that's a key point on this slide. Um, and so the current state of the art, lithium ion batteries is not gonna get there. Um, there are projections for how cheap lithium ion may get. Uh, currently in the range of $150 to $300 a kilowatt hour, and maybe we'll get down to $100 or $50 a kilowatt hour. But these studies here in the bottom left generally say we got to get below $20 in order for uh, us to reach, um, you know, large penetrations of renewable energy. And so that's the goal. That's the that's the cost target. Now, I've done a bit of a simplification here. There's actually multiple costs associated with a battery. One of them we like to call the cost per unit energy or the CPE. That is the cost of all the components in some systems. Just imagine a generic energy storage system, which may be a battery or could be something else. It could be a thermal system. It could be a mechanical system, but you have some set of components that store that um, are associated with the amount of energy you store. The cost of all of that is what we call the cost per unit energy. There may be other components that actually scale with how much discharge power you have. So the rate at which you charge and discharge the system may have separate components that have a separate cost. We call that the cost per unit power. You have to add both of these together to get the total cost of an energy storage system. The other key parameters are the round trip efficiency. So this is, you charge it with one joule of energy. How many, what fraction of a joule are you gonna get out on the other side uh, when you put energy back on the grid? And then there's also the lifetime, which is how long the system will last. Now, all these studies have some very interesting and important conclusions. The first and important conclusion is that compared, as you look at all these various factors, the most important one is the cost per unit energy. And the reason is that what we've realized is that in order to get to very high penetrations of renewables, you need energy storage that can have very long durations, meaning the battery can discharge for not just five hours or 10 hours, but almost 100 hours or longer. So you need a battery that can you can start discharging it on Monday and it's still discharging at the end of the week. Um, the second <clears throat> interesting realization is that the round trip efficiency doesn't actually have to be that high. And so the efficiency is one of the things that batteries have generally had on their side, you know, typically in the 80s and 90 percentiles of efficiency. But it turns out that you can actually have a battery with a very low efficiency that's actually still cost effective. And our estimates in our studies are that the threshold is around 35%, that as long as your round trip efficiency is above 35%, you can still make money from doing arbitrage. And the last you know, conclusion here is that that cost per unit energy needs to be generally below about $20 a kilowatt hour for this to be really competitive in the future for the future of the grid. So that's our nominal cost target. The other thing to appreciate is that we need lots of storage. So this is a result from 
a study looking at what, how much storage do you need if you wanted California itself to just go uh, fully renewable? And this, they don't even get to fully renewable. They just get to 50% penetration. And what you see here is the net load. So this is the net energy consumption in California. This is just like some fictitious data, like based on um, actual historical data, but like a projection of what would happen. You can see this is about 30 gigawatts. All right. And then now look over here at this plot. This is showing how much of the renewable energy is thrown away. That's the curtailment as a function of how much storage you have. And look here, this is the highest amount. So if you have equal amount of generating capacity and storage capacity, you still end up throwing some renewable energy away, even at 50 percent. So the point of this slide is simply to say that the amount of storage we are going to have to install on the grid is ginormous. It's equivalent or larger than the total amount of generation capacity. And worldwide, generation capacity, this is actually a typo, it's not nine terawatts, it's like six and a half terawatts globally. Um, and so, infrastructure globally in order to be able to. Now, the next question that might come to your mind is, well, what options do we have? Lithium-ion batteries are too expensive. We want to get below $20. Uh, their cost is between $150, $350. Pumped hydro is not even cheap enough. Um, it's got a second issue, which is that it is geographically limited, meaning you need natural formations of bodies of water at two different elevations. So that, that can only work in certain locations where that's happened naturally. And then there's another approach, which is under development called pumped heat storage. Still not cheap enough. It's about 35 to $50 a kilowatt hour uh, estimate. Um, but it has another potentially uh, interesting problem, which is that the ramping time is, is slow because they use a turbine. And I'll talk about that here. If you imagine what happens when you start having lots and lots of renewables on the grid, is that what happens is during the day, the sun is out, you get lots of overproduction of PV and you would ideally wanna store a lot of the overproduction from, from the PV. And then what happens is when the sun goes down, now something else like fossil turbines have to kick in or your energy storage resource has to kick in and compensate and kick in very fast over the course of one to two hours when the sun is going down. And it turns out for a turbine, that's actually really fast. Uh, to have a turbine ramp from essentially zero load to full load in the course of an hour actually places stress on the components and reduces their lifetime. And so this has actually caused the cost of electricity or the, or the price of electricity for renewables in south southwestern states to actually go negative in the summertime, where they actually pay other states to take the electricity off the grid because it's actually cheaper for them to do that than to stress the turbines trying to make them ramp really, really fast. So ideally, you want an energy storage resource that can respond very, very fast. And what is a unique and interesting feature of the technology that we're developing called thermal batteries is that our technology can respond in seconds. And so you can get very fast response time, which is very uh, important. So let me now walk you through the concept, how it works. I've been kind of alluding to how it might work, and that's, that's just kind of a bunch of setups so you can appreciate the aspects of the problem. The way this works is you start down here in the bottom left. You can take in electricity from any source agnostically. It doesn't really matter where it is. It just comes from the grid. You use this electricity to now run resistive heaters. And this may seem dumb because you could do better with a heat pump, but when you hear what temperatures we're dealing with, you would not want to use a heat pump. So we are essentially running electricity to run giant resistive heaters, which for all intents and purposes are like ginormous incandescent light bulb filaments. So they get about the same temperature. So they're like 2,500 degrees Celsius, so extremely hot. And what we do is we have piping made out of graphite. This entire system I'm describing is all held in an inert environment so that we don't get any oxidation. And we have piping that contains liquid metal, liquid tin and specifically. And we pump the liquid tin past these heaters and the liquid tin will heat up to a peak temperature of nominally 2,400 degrees Celsius. So above 2000 degrees C, glowing white hot, extremely hot. And it starts out at about 1900 degrees C. So we, it starts out very hot and we heat it even hotter. Then you flow this liquid metal over to a energy storage bank 
where we have very large graphite blocks. And these blocks are very inexpensive graphite. They're actually made out of a different grade of graphite than this tubing. The tubing is a bit more expensive. It's very dense wall, doesn't leak liquid tin. But this graphite blocks here are very cheap, 50 cents a kilogram. The liquid tin flows through these tubes and um, ends up heating up the tube and then the tube radiates its heat and heats up the block. And so this is essentially how you charge this thermal battery. So a thermal battery is essentially a grid scale rechargeable battery, but it's a system. So it's not just an electrochemical battery. Instead, it's actually a thermal battery. So you're storing energy as heat, but extremely high temperature heat. And you'll see why in a second. So as the liquid metal goes through, it cools as it heats up the blocks and then it gets circulated back over to this heating element to get reheated. And that's how you charge up the thermal battery. So when you wanna suck electricity off the grid, you put it into these blocks as sensible heat. When you then later want electricity back, so you, the heat stays inside this very large bank of thermal mass. And when you want the electricity back, you pump the, the liquid metal through these tubes to remove the heat and carry it over to this power block. Now, what's different here is normally, if you wanna do efficient conversion of heat to electricity, you would use a turbine. Turbines are the most efficient heat engines on earth. And instead here, we're doing something different, which is instead to use photovoltaics. And this is the reason we push the temperature so high. The temperature being so high, the entire infrastructure is glowing white hot. And instead of using a turbine, we actually convert some of the light coming off of the piping. And the reason we do this is because PV can actually be cheaper and similar efficiency to a turbine. So usually this is called thermal photovoltaics because the heat source is thermal. And it's essentially PV cells that are like infrared PV cells, rather than focusing primarily on uh, visible light, they uh, are have their band gaps shifted so that they um, do a very good job at converting infrared light. Now, this picture here is a blown up version of one of these little unit cells. So you have all these repeat cells where you have PV cells mounted to a heat sink. The heat sink can be dipped inside of this cavity, which is filled with light. These are all tubes made out of graphite that carry the liquid metal. Liquid metal goes down through here, heats these tubes up. These tubes then radiate light to this layer of tungsten foil. The tungsten is then what is facing the PV and sends light over to the PV, which then gets converted. The PV is actively water cooled, so it is not hot. It stays cold near room temperature. And the water is then dissipating its heat, some of the waste heat or all the waste heat that goes through the PV ends up in the water and then goes to a dry cooling unit out back. And so this is how this ends up being a system that can be put anywhere. Um, it's not geographically limited. Now this key piece I mentioned about the response time of the PV of this system giving you power out is that the PV can actually be retracted. So you can, we put this heat sink this on an actuator. So we can actually put the PV into the light or pull it back out. And that allows us to ramp from full on to full off in seconds, as soon as that actuator can pull it out. It's kind of like a control rod in a nuclear plant. Um, and the last thing is, you know, when this liquid metal goes through here, it cools off because it's entered, some of its energy is extracted. Then it goes back over to the storage unit, gets reheated by the blocks and comes back out. So that's how you discharge a thermal battery. Now, the big question you might ask is then, well, why is the cost so low? And the main reason we do all this, pay this big penalty thermodynamically on efficiency, is because storing heat is like 10 to 100 times cheaper than storing electricity electro electrochemically in a normal battery. And I just walked through this really simple one line cost argument so you can kind of see why the cost, the starting point of the cost is so low. Now, this is not the actual cost. This is like a lower bound for the cost. Like just saying the first component that you buy that you have to buy is all that graphite that's going to store the energy. So the minimum amount of money you can spend on your cost per unit energy is the cost of that graphite. Divide that by how much energy it's storing. So that's the heat capacity multiplied by the temperature swing. In our case, we're swinging at about 500 degrees from 1900 C up to 2400 C. And then you have this round trip efficiency. So you pay a penalty of a factor of two here, assuming we can get like a 50% efficiency. And I'll try to show you some data that suggests that we think we can get there. So when you divide this out, you get that the cost per unit energy is 10 to the minus $6 per joule. So that's like $3.6 per kilowatt hour. And that is almost 100 times cheaper than a lithium ion battery. So that is very, very cheap. And that is why the cost of the system has at least a very low starting point. 
But then if you go and you now start adding all these other components, you add the fact that this has got to be in an inert environment, you got pumps, you got valves, you got the tank, this whole thing, um, not the tank, but the storage got to sit on a, on a foundation. You've got insulation, construction costs, you've got the liquid tin, the insulation is very non-negligible cost. Um, and this is just the CPE, but at the end of the day, it comes out below $10 a kilowatt hour. So very, very attractive still, even though the cost of the medium is down here at 3.6, even when you add all the other stuff, it still stays below 10. So it's, it's more than twice the cost to add all the other components. And then you've got this other portion to the cost, which is the cost per unit power. You also have to pay for the uh, heater, we got to pay for the PV cells, we got to pay for the inverter, the, the, uh, the cooling system that's out back, all of that stuff, when you add it up, still comes to less than 35 cents a watt. Now, you might you need a point of comparison. A turbine, on the other hand, is like a dollar a watt. So this is like a third the cost of a turbine for our entire system on the power side. And that's why it's attractive, is the energy cost is low and the power cost is low. And that's why we went with PV instead of a turbine. Um, the efficiency of, of a turbine could conceivably be a bit higher. You could maybe get to like 55 to 60% efficiency. But the problem is that turbine doesn't exist. And I'll skip this, but this just basically shows that, you know, the, the economics play in our favor as you go large. The bigger this is, the better it gets. Um, and this is mainly because the insulation cost reduce, reduces. So it's the surface area to volume ratio that gets smaller as you make the size uh, system size bigger and bigger. But even at the tens of megawatt hour scale, uh, we are still presumably cheaper than lithium ion is today. So it's still very competitive even at smaller scale. Now, the main thing that I wanna get to to kind of help you appreciate, you know, if I was to have said this idea five years ago, it would sound like absolute insanity. And the reason it would is because I talked about pumping liquid metal at 2000 degrees Celsius, which just sounds kind of sounds dumb. And the reason it sounds dumb is because you can't make a pump that operates that hot. And the reason you can't make a pump, pump that operates that hot is because there's no seal. Not only is there no seal, there's like no material you could use. So there's no metal that you could use at 2000 degrees C that would be like chemically compatible with other liquid metals with one exception, which would be actually tungsten. Tungsten and liquid tin are actually chemically compatible and they don't react. But, um, but generally speaking, you'll get all kinds of corrosion. You'll have all kinds of problems in a system. And that was our new innovation that really set a lot of this off. So back in 2017, we published a paper uh, showing that we could, instead of using metals as the construction materials, instead use ceramics and graphite. And it was kind of a step change in paradigm to think about using uh, what are essentially brittle materials, brittle materials that uh, we would normally not think to use. You can't weld them together. You can't make uh, joints out of them. Um, and trying to figure out, you know, we solved the materials problem first by saying, here's a set of materials that will work, that will not corrode and are thermodynamically compatible with each other. But then the hard problem is, how do you make them work in a system? How do you make joints between two pieces of ceramic? How do you make joints between two pieces of graphite? And that was the challenge that we solved. Um, and so we used um, actually graphite. There are different forms of graphite that you can use as a seal. This is a video from our first time pumping at 1400 degrees C. Uh, we have another paper. We've since demonstrated pumping at above 2000 C. We've pumped silicon, we've pumped tin. Um, and so this whole approach can work. Um, and this was a, a significant technological breakthrough. The other question you might ask is then, well, why are you using this PV instead of a turbine? The efficiency boost might be worth it. Uh, I'll move through this pretty quickly and just say, you know, if you work out the efficiency, you look at where all the energy is going. Um, even with the tungsten facing the PV, uh, we can get to a little bit above 50%. And if you do multi-junction PV, you actually get a significant boost. Here's one junction in blue. If you add a second junction, you can get a five or more percent boost overall uh, in the device performance by adding a second junction. And so there are a variety of reasons that uh, we're very much interested in using PV. We think we can get to similar and comparable efficiencies to a turbine. And, and the improvement in response time actually outweighs the extra boost in efficiency. Now, another important uh, technological breakthrough that we had, uh, this is a paper that's about to come out in nature in a couple of weeks. Um, we recently set another record for thermal photovoltaic efficiency. So you can see here, um, this is uh, Dick Swanson's result from back in um, 1980. 
a couple of years before I was born, actually. Um, and he got to about 29%. Um, lots of work over the course of 40 years. Just recently, um, a good colleague here at Michigan uh, beat that record and got up to 32%. And just recently, we managed to demonstrate 41%, another big boost by going to even higher temperatures. And so when you go to higher temperatures, you shift the, you shift the, um, the radiative spectrum towards shorter wavelengths, and you can actually make a more efficient device in that way. And this is also a multi-junction cell um, that had multiple junctions, so we get that extra boost of the second junction. So we were able to achieve this over a decently wide temperature range. So um, you get very high efficiencies up around 40%. So this again, um, this is the first time to my knowledge that a solid state heat engine or specifically TPV has been more efficient than an average turbine. So this now um, ushers in a new era to really think about TPV as a, as a conceivable option for the conversion of heat to electricity in context that might even involve a fuel where you might have thought of using a turbine, but it may actually be similar in efficiency or you get some other benefits to actually possibly using MPV or uh, TPV. And this is hopefully gonna stimulate more interest and more funding into this because we think that there are some other approaches you can do to improve the reflectivity of, this, of the mirror on the back of the PV to get the efficiency up higher, get the reflectivity up to like 98% as Andre Leonard's been able to demonstrate and um, possibly using multi-terminal like three terminal devices to even get up to 50% or possibly even higher. And so we think there's some uh, very interesting prospects for continued improvement of these devices. And so this is very exciting. Um, the other important thing I want to point out about why we use TPV, or in this case, MPV, multi-junction PV, instead of a turbine, is when we first started with this, there was a very, very important barrier to doing this, which is that the turbine that we would need is a turbine that would operate based on an inert gas. We don't want to bring oxygen into our system. And that turbine doesn't actually exist today. So there was actually a very large barrier to the development of that turbine because development of a new turbine is essentially a hundred million dollar plus R&D exercise. And so, you know, the question is, could you convince GE or, um, or Siemens to go and actually develop a new turbine based on your, you know, crazy idea of doing, you know, 2000 degree C heat storage. And we didn't get great reception on that. And so we thought that going the PV route was a better approach because we could get better reception. There are companies that make PV cells that are, or have the equipment to make the cells that we need um, that could just be repurposed. And it's not as big of a jump for them. It's much lower, much lower cost um, switch in terms of uh, R&D development and switch of their hardware. Um, and also, again, we get the faster response time. This is a general, just overall depiction so you can get a sense for what this is likely to look like at scale. This is a gigawatt hour battery. I don't think there's ever been, I don't think a gigawatt hour battery has ever been built. Um, but interestingly, this scale here is this is about the size, the same size, if not a little bit smaller than a natural gas peaking plant that it could replace for hundred megawatts in terms of the same, same size. So um, it's very compact, it's very energy dense and very power dense. And, um, and that's what's partly what's very attractive. So we've been doing experiments with this for the last few years, making um, good progress towards demonstrating a lot, all the components separately. Where we're headed next is to actually integrate all the components and demonstrate them in a full system as a full battery operating together. But this is a set of experiments that we've been running recently where we have essentially a heater down here. We have a platform made out of graphite. We have a tungsten cavity. This object here is a heat sink made out of copper that's mounted on an actuator. We put PV cells on this, on this heat sink and then we actuate this rig inside the light so that we can have the PV output and then we can remove it. And we can do this whole process of inserting and removing the PV from the light. Let's just give you a glimpse of, you know, we are in fact running experiments above 2000 Cs. You can see here, this is a block of graphite insulation. Uh, once you get above about 1500 degrees C, there's only one kind of insulation you can use, which is actually made out of carbon. So this is carbon-based insulation. This is our heating element. It's like a serpentine path here. These are tungsten leads. So we have the tungsten leads to copper leads way down here outside the hot zone. And there's two long threaded pieces of, cop of tungsten that go up and are the connectors for the graphite uh, heating elements. This is the platform that it sits on. This is our cavity. And we line it with tungsten. And 
These are, this, these are you know, pictures from us running experiments. You get to 2000 C. This is actually, what you're seeing here is actually the edge of a tungsten uh, foil cavity. The tungsten itself is actually not glowing. You're just seeing the reflections from something about a foot away that's, that's uh, emitting a lot of light. And so we then put PV cells in and we can test them. And where we're headed next is to start testing an actual prototype that's got liquid metal flowing, same cavity putting in the PV where we can actually charge and discharge the full system and demonstrate uh, all these various aspects. And we're also trying to um, recently started a company called Thermal Battery Corporation. We're looking to uh, build a pilot scale demonstration at the one megawatt hour as well, demonstrate high efficiency PV, um, uh, getting to 50% efficiency. So now let me switch to the second topic because uh, I want to do this quickly so we can have some time for questions. So the way hydrogen is made today, we use hydrogen to make ammonia so we can make fertilizer so you can feed more than 7 billion people on earth. And the way it's done today is primarily using a process called steam methane reforming and a secondary reaction called the water gas shift reaction. And the way it works is you take methane, CH4, you react it with water. And what you're doing is you're taking the oxygen. It really wants to react with both hydrogen and carbon. And you allow that oxygen to pair with carbon to make CO. Three hydrogens come off. And then you get, um, um, I'm sorry, you get three hydrogens out. You get two, two hydrogens from here and one from the water. Then that CO can then be reacted with water to make CO2 and get an extra hydrogen. And so you can do all of this. <clears throat> to make hydrogen and ultimately, fundamentally, you have to make CO2 because that's the driving force for this reaction is the formation of the pairing of that oxygen with the carbon. Now there's another approach that's been around for a long time but has never really taken commercial foothold and, and I'll explain the reason why, which is to do direct thermal pyrolysis of methane. So instead of using the thermodynamic driving force of forming CO2, you could instead use heat as your direct driving force. And you can just heat methane up to a high temperature. Turns out when you get to about 1400 degrees C, methane decomposes into carbon and hydrogen spontaneously on its own. So you don't make any CO2, you just get solid carbon now. So this is a strange reaction because you actually get a gaseous byproduct and a solid byproduct at extremely high temperature. The fact that you get a solid is what's the problem, actually. The reason this doesn't work so well is because you make a solid. And if you imagine, just, just think of the simplest thing you could do. You just put in a tube, flow methane down a tube, and heat from the outside. Your tube gets hot. And now as your methane decomposes, your solid carbon will deposit on the walls of the tube, and eventually it'll plug itself. And then you'd have to shut the reactor down, get a plunger, plug out, plunge out all that carbon, set it up again and start it up again. And that process of heating and cooling makes the whole process non-economically uh, viable. So what you really need is like a continuous reactor. You need it to be able to stop, stay hot uh, the entire time and continually remove the carbon as it's made. And so that's what uh, we have as a concept. I cannot take credit for coming up with the concept of using liquid metal itself. Uh, that I would credit to Thomas Wetzel in Germany. They uh, were the first to demonstrate this idea. To solve the plugging problem, what you can do is instead use an inert liquid as an intermediate heat transfer fluid. And so the way this works is you imagine you have methane being bubbled up through a column, through a container containing 1400C liquid tin. As the bubbles rise, they reach 1400 degrees C, and the reaction takes place now inside the bubble and you'll get little carbon particles inside the bubble. When the bubble reaches the surface, the gas continues to rise and goes out through a gas port. So you get the gas separate and the carbon will just float on the liquid tin surface. The carbon floats because the carbon density is about two and a half times lower than that of tin. So there's a big density difference, tin's a heavy metal. And the other beautiful thing about this is, as I mentioned before, tin and carbon have no chemical interaction at any temperature. So they can just sit in contact with each other without any corrosion or any byproducts. So it's a nice, clean reactor. <clears throat> the issue is you gotta get to 1400C for the reaction to complete. The beauty of us being able to pump liquid metal though, we can pump liquid tin, means we can actually move that carbon out by pumping the liquid metal and carrying the carbon out on the, on the liquid metal surface. 
You could then envision interesting and innovative types of heat exchangers where as this liquid is flowing out, carrying the carbon, you could separate it, it cools down. You can use a cyclone or a centrifuge to separate out the carbon, scavenge your liquid tin and put it back in. It's cold and then it can go back as a counterflow heat exchanger and go back into your reactor and you can, sat, you can recuperate all the heat in the carbon. You can also do interesting things <clears throat> like putting protrusions on this surface to, for example, keep the carbon in line and keep it from floating and touching the sidewalls and possibly sticking to the sidewalls to avoid the plugging problem. And you can also do interesting recuperation on the hydrogen side, because again, you now it's, it's rare that you end up in this situation, but you now have a liquid that has low vapor pressure and it can touch both of your materials, your reactants and your products without chemically reinteracting. So now you don't actually have to have a heat exchanger with a wall anymore. You can actually get rid of the wall in the heat exchanger and do direct contact heat exchange. So you could imagine doing a heat exchanger where, think of it like a shower head of liquid tin. Liquid tin is falling, little droplets, and you can blow hydrogen up in counterflow and have direct interaction between the hydrogen and the droplets and exchange heat and counterflow with direct contact rather than with a solid wall in between. This allows you to make what we call a liquid droplet heat exchanger. There's actually been some research on this back in the 70s and 80s looking at this. And this apparently these heat exchangers work really, really well. Um, and you can build this and these can be very inexpensive and very cost effective to do it this way. So um, let's talk about the economics. What's compelling about this, again, is economics. We want to find solutions that are actually cheap. And so the beauty of this approach is that you not only sell hydrogen, you also get to sell the carbon. So the carbon that you tend to make is what's called carbon black. It's like nanoscale carbon, little tiny particles. And the price that you can sell carbon black for really depends on the um, microstructure and the nanostructure. And it ranges you know, on the low end from about $500 a ton on the high end, $2,500, $3,000 a ton. You can get very expensive carbon black. Now, what's shown here is the break-even price. So assuming this is what's the lowest cost you can sell your hydrogen for and break even where you uh, pay for your reactor and all your feedstock, methane, and the electricity. And it's a function of the carbon black price because if you can now sell the carbon, the more expensive your carbon is, the less you can sell your hydrogen for. You can sell your hydrogen even cheaper and still break even. So this is the range of carbon black prices. And what you see here is that this methane pyrolysis approach, my pyrolysis approach, gets cheaper than not only the DOE targets at $2 a kilogram, but actually gets cheaper than steam methane reforming and the existing process that actually makes CO2. And this is what's so compelling about this idea is that you may actually be able to displace the existing process which has CO2 as an externality. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting to look at is where does the cost go? Well, the majority of it goes into buying the methane and the electricity. There are some O&M costs and the CapEx associated with the reactor itself is actually not that much. And if you make a, this is for actually a really small reactor. As you make a big reactor, this part gets smaller and smaller, wholly dominated by the cost of the methane and the electricity. So now when we, uh, we actually updated this, the, those initial estimates I showed you on the previous slide are actually older numbers and some conservative estimates for the price of natural gas. Once you realize the gas price and the electricity price matter so much, let's do a, a more accurate estimate. So now if you take the average natural gas price for the last decade, now the entire curve shifts to the left. It actually turns out it's really cheap actually. Even if you buy 12 cent a kilowatt hour uh, uh, electricity, and you don't do recuperation, you actually get below the price of steam methane uh, reforming um, at well, uh, you know, at like three hundred dollars uh, a ton. But it gets even better because if you can use six cent a kilowatt electricity and do recuperation, for example, you can see how the curve moves further and further to the left. You can afford to sell that carbon down at ten and uh, ten to fifty dollars a ton. Very, very cheap carbon and your hydrogen cost, hydrogen price can be at a dollar and really can undercut the cost of steam methane reforming the existing process. So now another key question you got to ask yourself is, all right, so if you could undercut the price and you now imagine that this process takes over and this is the predominant way we're producing hydrogen, great, because now we're not making CO2, what are you going to do with all that carbon? So if you look at how much carbon it is, it actually will overrun the carbon black market very quickly. 
And so the question is, what are you going to do with all that carbon? We can say, well, I'll throw it away. Well, we found that there may be a better idea, which is use it to actually make a construction material. So I have a colleague at UCSD. He has a very, very interesting process, um, quite an amazing feat. He usually, if you make a composite, let's say you're going to use this carbon powder and add a binder to it. If you want to make something strong, like you use a construction material, you would have, you would usually imagine you got to add like 50% of it's going to have to be binder. It's got to be a lot of binder and very little carbon or at least half carbon, something like that. And he has an amazing process he's developed where he's actually reduced the binder content down to like 4%. So he can use a very, like, it's like a mound of powder and one little droplet of binder. And he's actually able to make a construction material that's stronger than steel reinforced cement. Now, the reason that's in, is, is particularly exciting is because cement production is actually the biggest polluter in industry. It's, about, it's responsible for about 10% of global carbon emissions is cement production. So if you could actually use this process to make a carbon-based material that's 95 plus percent carbon and replace cement, then you actually get an even bigger benefit of avoiding about 10% of CO2 emissions by replacing cement. So that's actually the bigger play here is actually seeing if you can use this to make construction materials to replace cement. So now let's go back to this problem about how do you make it work? So like I said, Thomas Wetzel's group has demonstrated this. You can use, you know, he, he pointed out, he showed this plugging problem. He showed that if you put liquid tin in a reactor, you can get the carbon to float on the surface. We've shown, or let me, let me maybe explain the problem uh, that he ran into. The problem he ran into is that he made his vessel out of stainless steel and stainless steel and liquid tin do not interact well. So you will eat through a stainless steel vessel very quickly with liquid tin. So that limited him on temperature. So he couldn't go very hot because the steel corrosion rate is gonna accelerate with hotter and hotter tin. And it also limited his lifetime. So he wasn't able to uh, run for very long. And he also wasn't able to show like a continuous reactor. He could separate and keep it from plugging, but he'd still have to sh shut the reactor down and scoop out the carbon. So this is our reactor. So our main contribution here is that we can make the entire reactor out of, out of graphite. We can make a reactor that can go to 1400C. It can go even beyond 1400C. We can go as high as we want. Basically, we can go to 2000C. Not that we would want to, but uh, because the reaction reaches completion at 1400C, but we are, we are not temperature limited anymore. So we built a small reactor. We put liquid tin in it. And surprisingly, <laughs> it was one of the few experiments, the first time we turned it on, it actually worked. Um, so we split methane, we get carbon, and something very interesting happened in our reactor that's very different than uh, Thomas, Thomas Wetzel's reactor. Thomas Wetzel's reactor, I suspect, was being operated at very low methane flow rate. He was interested in the individual bubble regime. So you just bubble it up nice and slow, and you get individual bubbles coming up one at a time. We decided to run it at higher flow rates, and you get lots of bubbles coming in. When there's lots of bubbles, what ends up happening is the carbon on the surface of the tin is getting like fluffed up as those bubbles are agitating the surface. And it turns out the carbon goes out with the hydrogen. So we actually got most of the hydrogen out coming out with the, I'm sorry, most of the carbon came out with the hydrogen. This is just showing you glimpses of how we build this system. We put it inside of a vacuum chamber. We don't run it in vacuum. We actually run it in one atmosphere argon. Uh, but this is just completely surrounded by carbon insulation. Uh, it's a small reactor, and this is showing that we get the full conversion at 1400C. So I believe this is the first time it's been demonstrated with this liquid tin approach that you can get the full conversion at 1400C. Um, and you can see here, these are uh, measurements from our GC showing uh, that it works. You can see the methane uh, concentration decreasing as you go hotter and hotter, and then you get full, just pure hydrogen coming out. And so interestingly, we saw our carbon pile up in one of the valves on the outlet of the chamber. It was actually coming out with the hydrogen. And so we're now replacing this with a little cyclone so we can continuously separate it. And one thing we realized is we actually may not really have to flow it out with the liquid tin. We may be able to just separate it from the gas. And that's actually a really nice, easy simplification for us because that's even easier for us to separate. Uh, we actually have already built a, a cyclone. We're just installing it now. We'll be trying this very soon in the next few weeks. But this is a technology I'm very excited about. Could potentially move from the lab scale to, you know, as a first prototype to something commercial in a very short time in just a few years. Uh, we basically just need to build a bigger one. Um, and this could be commercially viable very quickly. 
So this is just showing you a little bit more that we made up, you know, you make a lot of carbon very quickly. I mean, this, this, uh, this ran for just a couple hours. You can fill this container at just a few liters per minute of uh, methane flow rate. Um, the carbon that we get is interesting. So it's got some interesting features. It's got some features at the uh, tens of micron scale, the hundreds of nanometer scale. And you can see this is like carbon black, these little spheres. I, I talked to a guy, um, his name's Pete Johnson. He gave me a great <laughs> uh, mental picture for how he described uh, what carbon black is because his company would sell carbon black. He said, think of carbon black as a bunch of little grapes. It's like a bunch of little grapes on a vine. And the more grapes you get and the size of the grapes is uh, what determines how much price, what you can sell your carbon black for. And so these are the little grapes. These are the little carbon black particles that we see in our um, product. So I'll stop there. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, Funding and support, none of this would be possible without NSF, RPE, ONR, um, CETO at the Department of Energy, and MITE at MIT. And I'll be very, very happy to take any questions that you have. I look forward to the discussion. This was great. Thank, th th thanks so much, uh, Ishigan. This was really a lot of um, very impressive stuff. Um, so maybe maybe as people are thinking about coming up with some questions, I, I can I can get get us started here just with a few. I, I've written several in my notes here, but but just one kind of big picture question. You've talked about a lot of devices that you guys are building and working with, which are high temperature. Um, and you know it, it involves uh, uh, you know carbon-based materials as well as like um, tin and things like that. So my, my two questions there. So with, with carbon, do you have challenges with just oxidation at the surface if you're making um, like containments out of carbon? And then another question would be, with, when you think about operating at high temperatures, how are you actually measuring these temperatures? Like, you know, beyond okay. 1,500 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I don't really know, um, yeah. you know, what, what kind of certainty uh, and what kind of tools you probably develop to measure these temperatures. Yeah, so uh, to the first question about oxidation. So this, this is a, I remember when we were first coming up with this idea, I got to credit a lot of this development to a good mentor and collaborator I had at uh, Georgia Tech, and he's now at Purdue. Uh, Professor Ken Sandage, he, I learned a lot about high temperature materials and systems from him. He had a really important, very early insight when we were writing our first uh, RPE proposal. And he was saying, you know, we were, we were talking about spray coating of oxide coatings on stuff. And, and he said, you know, if, if this is really for the energy industry, they're so risk averse that you're probably going to end up building some inert containment vessel around this anyway. Like you, you'll probably put all these oxidation coatings anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, but at the end of the day, they're not going to rely on coatings. And and at that moment, like a light went off for me. It's like, yeah, you're right. I mean, we should just accept from the beginning that we're going to build this in an inert environment. And once you do that, actually, life simplifies itself and lots of new opportunities come on the table. Once mm -hmm. you take out oxygen out of the equation, your range of materials you can use explodes, right? Because there's all kinds of refractory metals you can use, but there's very few that can survive at high temperature with a native oxide coating that, mm -hmm. that, won't, that won't come off. You know? And so once you take oxygen, which essentially will react with almost every element on the periodic table, once you mm -hmm. take that, you know, I don't want to call it a bad actor. I mean, we, <laughs> we breathe it for the same reason. Um, but once you take oxygen out of the equation, life gets a lot simpler because now you can essentially use whatever materials you want because nothing interacts with the argon atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say to question number one. Um, to question number two about how do we measure temperature? So there are different kinds of thermocouples you can use up to about 2000 C. There, one, the issue is when you get that hot, the metals that the thermocouples are made out of actually will start to diffuse into each other and you'll kill them. So they, they, they don't really have long life, but you can get tungsten based thermocouples and things like that. And we've used those. What we found is more reliable. It's got a, there's, there's a disadvantage, which is its line of sight, um, but you use pyrometers. Now pyrometers work very, very well, nice, reliable. Um, you've, you know, for us, it works because we've got a chamber that's got windows on it. So we just have to do some, planning ahead of time, we have to know where we want to measure the temperature and we position it relative to the window. Um, so that's a little bit of a constraint, but it's not a it's not a deal breaker in any respect. Um, so we're able to work around that, but pyrometers have worked out very, very well for us. Okay. 
Yeah, and I guess for the just as a quick follow up for the parameters, you probably also need to characterize the optical properties of whatever your, is in your line of sight to no, correct for so, the temperature dependence. Yeah. So no, actually, the the, the commercial okay. parameters you buy there's a the, there are two color parameters. Okay. So they okay. they work based on what they do is they measure uh, two different uh, they measure how much light you're receiving at two different wavelengths that are near each other. And yeah. so the ratio of how much you're receiving is independent of the optical properties, assuming that the optical properties don't vary too much between those two wavelengths. Okay, okay, great. Um, if anybody else has a question, maybe feel free to um, raise your hand first and then unmute yourself. And, and, and you can post on chat too, if you want me to ask your question. Okay, while people are maybe thinking of, of, of a few more questions, I, I have another one on, on the, on the uh, methane pyrolysis um, uh, project that we were talking about. I guess when you, when you start introducing liquid tin in, um, does it kind of behave like a eutectic um, and, and therefore you don't really have to go to 1400 degrees Celsius at all? Like the tin yeah. and the carbon, or, or I mean, is there any games that you can play there when you introduce liquid tin into the system? You don't really have to play many games because tin tin okay. is quite amazing. Tin tin melts on its own at two thirty two degrees okay. C, so that it's like solder. So mm -hmm. it melts low yeah. and boils high at twenty six hundred degrees C. So it has a huge liquidus range, and we actually have found that the best thing to do for us, at least, is to keep things simple. We try, mm -hmm. to, we try to minimize the number of elements that are in our chamber. Because once you, once you heat up and you get this hot or anywhere in this, this temperature range, any chemical interactions that can happen will be accelerated. They will happen very quickly. You will, yeah. If there is some corrosive byproduct that can form, it will happen very fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you were talking about how the, the, the carbon that you're producing uh, needs to be of a certain morphology. Uh, what kind of reactor design or operating changes can you make to achieve that? Is it kind of like modulating the flow rates? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really yeah. good question. So, so the short answer is we don't actually know just yet what kind of carbon we want to make. So mm -hmm. we've got some carbon that's come out of our reactor. We're doing some initial yeah. analysis now. Uh, we're sending it to my collaborator at UCSD to get some you know, initial uh, attempts at trying to convert it into a construction material, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get we'll get some feedback from him and and figure out how we want to change things. But if you ask you, know, you ask like essentially what knobs do we have on the reactor? Yeah. So we have bubble size, so we can change the orifice diameter on where the where the methane's coming in. We have temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, we could shift temperature up or or down. Um, we could actually if let's say we didn't get to one hundred percent. Reaction, we could actually have hydrogen with a little bit of residual methane in it and recycle it and and flood it uh, flow it back through a second time. So we have that option. Uh, we also have the option um, of changing the liquid tin column height, which mm -hmm. is the bubble's duration in that high temperature environment. So we have that as another variable. There are a number. I've got some collaboration going where we're thinking about if you might want to actually dope. The tin mm -hmm. with a catalyst. To me, if you go this hot, you don't really need a catalyst because this, yeah. this all happens very fast anyway. Um, but you might be able to dope it with some um, iron or some other metals that might lie to get like nanotubes out or something like that. So you might be able mm -hmm. to grow other, um, other allotropes of carbon. That yeah. could be very interesting. Um, so, you know, ideally we want to make the highest value carbon we can. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's our big thing. If we could make, nanotubes or if we could make fibers or if we could make anything that actually would have greater value than carbon black, we definitely will. So those are things that we're gonna be exploring. I know I saw once um, a colleague of mine um, was, was mentioning that, you know, he could tune his, he was doing a um, pyrolysis reactor that was based on plasma, um, yeah. so not liquid like tin, um, but he was saying that, yeah, he could tune his reactor to uh, make like pyrolytic graphite if he wanted mm. to. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so there's other forms of carbon that we could possibly make. And so we're just getting started with this. Is, this is really new uh, results showing that our uh, reactor is working. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I believe Pramod has a question. Pramod, maybe you can just directly unmute yourself. You yeah, can you, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I was just wondering how um, challenging it is to thermally insulate this graphitic storage devices. You mentioned insulation is a substantial part of the problem. I was just wondering, uh, how do you typically insulate this and, and what fraction of the energy is lost? Uh, yeah. Because every time you have a downtime, when you're not producing energy, you're paying this penalty. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, so this is a very important piece of our techno-economic analysis. So in short, you just basically make the graphite insulation layer sufficiently thick to lose. We, we nominally design for about a 1% loss per day. So that 1% of the heat stored is leaking out through the insulation per day. So if on day one, you have 100% charge, day two, you'll have 99% charge. Um, and this is typical, <clears throat> that, that figure where we got that from is this is nominally like where concentrated solar power plants are designed to operate. So they operate with about 1% loss per day. Um, and as you could see, I could go back, let me show you the cost matrix. You can see that that, that graphite insulation is not cheap. Um, it is one of the most significant costs in the system. It is not prohibitively expensive, but it is, um, but it is expensive. I mean, I'm just going to pull up the slides so you can see it. So I, I guess I'm, I don't know. Maybe I, I'm not catching this earlier. The graphite insulation is it just kind of like closed cell foams, and therefore it's insulating? Because you can also think of graphite foams to be really conductive, right? That's right. So this is. Uh, let me show you. Okay. Let me show what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So this this material you're seeing around here. So it's very high surface area carbon. This is not, this is, this is a much smaller pore size than foam. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in the same vein, it's, you know, these are not macroscopic pores that you can really see. It looks like felt. Um, there's a variety of forms that it's made in. This is, this is the rigid board that we buy. We like it because it can support the weight of all this mm -hmm. stuff on top of it. But you can actually buy a felt that's fabric, that's uh, flexible. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a variety of different types that you can buy. There's rayon base, there's um, pan base, there's a few different types, um, but it's not, uh, it's not cheap stuff. Mm. Um, but let me see if I can grab, let me see if I can get the economics to pull up. Oh, here we go. All right, so here you can see the graphite insulation, this gray portion in the legend. That's this section here. So similar magnitude of cost as the actual graphite storage itself. Mm -hmm. So that's like another dollar per kilowatt hour or so. So it's very non-negligible. So it's, you make a great point. Um, it's one of the most significant costs in the system in addition to the actual medium itself. And so this is why we do this kind of technical economic analysis is to, to realize that this is the issue. And that's why going to large scale helps you so much is because the surface area to volume gets smaller. And so you actually win going big because then the graphite layer, the insulation layer is smaller, uh, uh, same size, but it's a smaller fraction of the total system. Thanks, Patrick. Yep. Great. This and maybe maybe we, we can uh, deem this as the last question for the official session. Uh, Stephen, do you maybe want to unmute and ask your question? Um, thank you for your talk. First of all, this was really interesting. Um, I was curious about the thermal battery um, for uh, what went into choosing the uh, storage material or it sounded like you used carbon. Was it purely just a cost analysis or were there other things as well? It yeah, it's basically, it's basically cost. Um, the combination of cost and the ability to have a large temperature range. Initially, when we first started thinking about this, we were actually focused on silicon. Uh, so we were using liquid silicon in a two tank storage approach. That's why I said we, uh, we pumped silicon above 2000 C. Back in the day, we were uh, a few years ago, we were focused on silicon. 
Um, and then we just kind of started to look at the benefits of going to graphite. And it's just, it's like four times cheaper to go to carbon. Mm -hmm. And that 4X drop in cost, you know, is the difference between a $40 per kilowatt hour battery, which was compelling. But if lithium ion one day gets to 50, it's not very compelling. And so if you go with carbon and we're at 10, then it's, that's a bigger margin. And uh, we, have, we have more room to play and it's much more compelling. I mean, the disadvantage with using carbon is that now what happens is your output temperature for the liquid tin is, is transient. So when we had a liquid storage medium, you could flow the liquid through the power cycle and you basically have nice steady state operation during the entire discharge. With a solid, the solid is stationary, you're moving the liquid through it. And so as the entire solid starts to cool, your liquid output temperature will eventually at some point start to drop. And when it does, now your power output will trail off at the end of the discharge. However, that effect seems to be smaller in value or cost to the overall value of the system as compared to the 4X drop in, in CPE, which, which, is, which just outweighs the cost, uh, outweighs the benefits. I'm sorry. Its benefits outweigh the cost uh, much more. Cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. It, it's two after five, so I'll, I'll kind of formally close the session. Um, thanks, everyone, and thanks again for our seminar speaker for such an excellent talk um, and for really sort of uh, instigating a lot of interest in, in high temperature systems and technologies. Um, thanks again, Ashkin. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.